This video is sponsored by Squarespace. First thing, I'm a bit sick today, and second thing, we're gonna do a lot of thinking, so I want you to be prepared for this. You know Jubilee, right? This YouTube channel whose mission is to promote empathy and to organize rankings, debates, and conversation on controversial topics. Well, today I want to base my entire video on that moment here. I saw that clip in Tara Mooney's video on Jubilee, and to be fair, a lot of the things I'm going to say today connect to what she said in her video, but I also wanted to look at it through a different lens to kind of complement what she did. To give a bit more context, the clip is from a video titled Do All Christians Think the Same? Participants are given prompts and then position themselves on the spectrum depending on whether they agree with the prompt. And so for every prompt, this woman in particular has shown that she's a hardcore Christian, she's very conservative. At some point in the video, she explained that she did not support the LGBT community because trigger warning homophobia, quote, where do you draw the line, she asks. If anybody can love anybody, then a grown man can love a boy and it's fine. All of that led to that moment at the end of the video. And I find this moment super interesting because it's extremely rare on Jubilee. I mean, it's not uncommon to hear that sort of dog whistle communication on the show, but Jubilee turned those debates into a game. People generally end with hugs and laugh and yay, that was fun type of thing. To be fair, little parenthesis here, but debate culture in general is very much like that, you know. It's quite common to see students in debating society argue against uh, this or that topic that is quite heavy, you know, immigration, human rights, etc. And then once the debate is over, they all go together, get a pint, and that's it. It was just a game. But something different happened on that episode. The woman, a Christian herself, refused to high-five the hardcore homophobic participant, and by doing so, she subtly reminded us that this is not a game that these ideologies are deeply harmful. So why did I title this video Jubilees Like Peach? And yes, I'm gonna have to use the word peach to refer to, you know what, you guessed it from the title. Peach is based on transgression. I'm not teaching you anything new. When you go on the Peach website, most of the content you see consists of role plays of things that are most of the time illegal in real life when not consented. Now, a lot of people watch those videos, but does that mean that all of them are pedophiles or no. I mean, it would be really scary if it was the case. Actually, it's been shown that women also have juicy legal fantasies, but that doesn't mean they want those fantasies to happen in real life. Jubilee works the same way. People across the political spectrum watch those videos because they know it's going to be transgressive. The titles, the thumbnails indicate that. In both cases, the problem is not so much the platform they make it seem, because those ideas exist in society anyway. The problem is you the viewer, the consumer. I mean, why do you watch that? Because it's transgressive, it's raw, it's unfiltered. The series of video Jubilee made on ranking people according to attractiveness is a good example of that. I found this video to be particularly interesting. 2.5 million views. The title is Whose Girlfriend is the Most Attractive? I mean, that's not something you can do in real life, you know? I mean, some do it, but it's not nice. So first, the girls had to rank themselves and Ajania ended up first. The girl said she had a bubbly personality, that she was cute and had great style. However, when the guys ranked the girls, Ajania ended up last. The guys would say, quote, she's not my type. Whereas Sky, who they said had the Kardashians features, I believe, was ranked first. Quote, it seems like a guy's choice, said Ajania. Quote, I'm not really sure what the guys factored in to get there. <coughs> Quote, but I think that the girls have a more open-heartedly perspective. The difference between the girls' ranking and the guys' ranking is this notion of desirability. What is deemed desirable in a given society is conditioned by many factors. Class, health, skin color, body shape, etc. Now, the Jubilee videos tend to reduce attraction to physical appearance, but we know scientifically that it's not limited to it, it's not true. However, the videos make it seem like it, and because you see the same bodies and same faces being validated or rejected, the same choices being made you learn how to predict them. It's a game. Progressively, you internalize those patterns of desirability, meaning that black, fat, disabled equals not desirable, loser, white, thin, but not too thin, able-bodied, yes, hottie, you win. On Peach now, you understand the politics of desirability because they are literally thrown onto your face. The jubilee ritual of, yeah, we're all friends, we're all beautiful no matter what, blah, 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 does not exist in Peach. Sure, there are multiple categories and you can pick what you want, but 
generally speaking, the same ethnicities, the same body types, the same faces are prioritized over others. Speech also exacerbates relationships of domination between the men and women, since women are almost systematically submissive. And to that, you also need to add all the racist stereotypes um, that are used in role plays, like when you have a lot of black men with one woman, or the orientalist, Arab woman trope, etc., etc. But again, because it is a role play, because it is entertaining, it doesn't have to be understood as the truth right? Basically the question is, um, how is what is portrayed on screen understood? Is it understood by the audience as role play, as a game, therefore not taken seriously? Or is it understood as a guide, education, as real life? In 1974, feminist activist Robin Morgan declared that, quote, pitch is the theory, rape is the practice. Activists of the Women Against Violence in Peach and Media organized protests against film, ad campaigns, and any media production that displayed violence towards women. For them, Peach wasn't just a depiction of violence, it was propaganda, it was patriarchy in its purest form. As philosopher Amya Srinivasan explained, quote, to say that it is porn's function to effectuate its message is to see porn as a mechanism not just for depicting the world, but for making it. Following anti-peach activist logic, it would be necessary to ban all depictions of violence towards women, to ban peach altogether. Actually, that is what anti-peach activists wrote in a series of ordinances to US jurisdictions. They said that peach legitimizes the subjugation and violence towards women. Now, judges agreed. However, they argued that anti-peach activists revealed the power of peach as speech. Peach says something. It says that women are submissive that a no can turn into a yes with insistence, etc. But making that comparison allowed them to defend Peach through the freedom of speech. The jurisdictions cannot take sides, they said. In other words, someone cannot be condemned for expressing the viewpoint that women are sexual objects. By stopping their analysis there, the jurisdictions in charge of evaluating the ordinances refused to look at what Peach does, how it is understood by the audience, how it can be internalized and reproduced. On the other hand, it only looked at what Peach says. Jubilee is like the jurisdiction. It seeks to guarantee free speech and refuses to take sides, meaning it refuses to look at how the opinions shared on those debates are understood. As long as what is said is not a crime or blatant hate speech, it's fine. But is it fine? Is it fair? When anti-peach feminists argued that peach should be regulated, or when social justice advocates demand that Jubilee take responsibility, they recognize that both entities have authority, that what they say is understood by many as the truth. Peach and Jubilee refuse to be perceived as having any form of authority, which makes sense because with authority comes responsibility, and they don't want to have to deal with that. But let's be honest here, the amount of views Peach websites get, the amount of views Jubilee videos get, kind of automatically give them legitimacy. In the internet world, authority comes with engagement, likes, follows. So what should be done? Well, it's a tough question. It sounds hypocritical to say that depictions of hate speech in the context of a game or roleplay aren't understood as hate speech by the audience. Sure, a section of the audience is critical enough to see what is problematic, to be aware, but we can't pretend it's all the audience. No, for me the problem is that Jubilee and Peach are perceived as authorities. You know, young people go to Peach to learn about sex. I did it myself. Young people go to Jubilee to find what seems like um, professional, high-quality debates. Because of that, it is necessary to put a lot of pressure on those industries to force them to act with responsibility. But that is only the tip of the iceberg. The real question here is why Jubilee and Peach are taken seriously? And the answer is because there is no alternative, no competing authority. If every single young person was stoked proper sex head at school, one that includes the notion of pleasure, desire, consent, gender norms, etc. They wouldn't see Peach as an authority. They would naturally understand that it is fake. If every young person was educated on what human rights are, the struggles we went through to get those rights, how a society that valorizes human rights is more powerful on every single level, and yes, also on the financial level, you filthy capitalist, they probably wouldn't care about the opinions of anti-human rights extremists, and they would probably start to look down on platforms like Jubilee for even platforming those very regressive ideologies. Talking about filthy capitalism, try to imagine what the internet would look like if people weren't incentivized to produce content for capitalist gains. I'll let you think about that for a few minutes. A few moments later. I'm pretty sure something like Jubilee wouldn't exist. Transgression, sensationalism sells really well, it's clickbait. And sure, Jubilee will tell you that they are powered by a mission to bring back empathy or foster dialogue or 
what not. But that's corporate BS, you know. And I know some of you will say, oh, you criticize them or ask to regulate their content only because you don't agree with it. But hey, that's not true. I'm also very critical of work washing, of pink washing, etc. But at the same time, I don't believe work washing and anti-human rights sensationalism are on the same level, you see? Precisely because liberal democracies are based on declarations of human rights. It is in our democracy's DNA to protect and expand human rights and liberties, but it cannot happen without censorship. Oh, that's a controversial term. Censorship tends to signal authoritarianism. Censorship sounds like the opposite of what a democracy is supposed to be. But when you think about it, censorship is practiced all the time within liberal democracies. When a journalist or a media outlet chooses to platform a specific opinion of another, they practice a form of censorship. So of course we can debate on the use of a term like censorship to describe that phenomenon, but deep down it is what it is. People who are in a position of influence can choose what to put forward and what to silence, and that is not necessarily bad slash anti-democratic. In France and many other countries around the world, jurisdictions have put limits on freedom of speech. For example, hate speech, which includes racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, ableism, etc., as well as negationism, so the denial of the Shoah, aren't protected by the freedom of speech, because the protection of human rights, the foundation of democracy, comes first. The problem today is that one can attack human rights without hate speech, by using what is called dog whistle, but that is something that people who support democracy, who support human rights, must be able to spot and to systematically fight against. Because we know dog whistle is understood the same way as hate speech, and that both should be treated the same way, meaning with resistance, not with compassion. Sure, we can show empathy and understanding in the way we evaluate how an individual came to believe in a certain ideology, or how an individual can turn problematic behaviors into role play. But we have to remain critical. We have to remind ourselves of how things are understood by the majority, to remind ourselves of what is perceived as the authority and how to make sure that what is perceived as the authority is compatible with a democratic society, meaning one that prioritizes human rights and liberties above all. If that is not the case, then there is no reason to high-five at the end. In 2002, French President Jacques Chirac refused to debate with far-right candidate Jean-Marie Le Pen because he didn't want to participate in the standardization of far-right ideas. Chirac wasn't a social justice warrior, no, 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 he was right-wing. But what he did was a form of censorship for the survival of the foundation of democracy, which is the belief and protection of human rights. Profit-motivated centrist media betrays that democratic tradition when they give extremist ideologies a space to exist. They betray that democratic tradition when they refuse to responsibly use censorship because no, 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 we have to find a middle ground between all existing ideologies. I'm sure they believe they act democratically, but they don't. They act irresponsibly and that has consequences for human rights, for the future of our democracies. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always, the conversation continues in the comment section. I'm really curious to see what you have to say about this one. Uh, don't forget to like, to subscribe, if it's not done already. Before I leave, I would like to introduce you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can create your own website around your preferred aesthetic from a catalog of templates and use it as a landing platform for all the activity you do. YouTube, online shop, blog, podcast, photography, etc. Once that is set up, you can connect all your social media accounts and share content between different platforms. Squarespace can also help you create effective email campaigns to really connect with your community. Finally, they had this very cool feature where you can connect and learn from other creators like Adrien Raquel, who will show you how you can best use the platform. If you feel like Squarespace is made for you and you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you've experimented and you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video. Thank you to my Patreon for their support. And a special thank to top tier patrons, Tristan, Patricia, Marcelo, Christopher, Ian, Donage, Ren, Alex, Sam, Manuel, Dakota, Jay, Benjamin, Oswald, Perry, and Carla. Other than that, I'll see you very soon, probably next week or this week, actually. And yeah, salut